with Resistance Fall of Man, when we established MyResistance.net, the first thing we got was a ton of feedback on the game, both for multiplayer and for single player. And we made some big tweaks to the design based on what players were telling us. There's so much that's different about Resistance 2. We have online co-op now to eight players. We've got 60 player multiplayer. We've got a huge campaign mode and we're introducing a, a much uh, richer community aspect. We knew that we needed to beef up co-op after releasing Resistance Fall of Man. One of the questions we got over and over again is, why didn't you do online co-op? What's your problem? And we said, okay, let's just bite the bullet, go for online co-op, but let's take it a little further. Let's do eight player online co-op. And it really does stand out as something very different that Resistance 2 offers. We wanted to give people defined roles and clear dependencies and relationships with their friends. Uh, that brought us to developing our, our three core classes, which are the soldier, who is the primary damage absorber for the group, the medic, who is responsible for uh, maintaining the team's health and reviving down team members, um, and the spec ops, who's really responsible for the majority of the damage dealing in the group. Three classes really um, create relationships and dependencies that force people to play together. This gives each class the opportunity to shine in specific encounters and really allows people to have their specific moment in the game, drawing out the hero in everyone. The overall concept was scale. We really need to bring the multiplayer up to speed with the single player. And to do that, our technology guys uh, really came through for us. We ended up getting uh, focusing on 60 player battles. In Resistance 2, we're offering deathmatch, team deathmatch, and capture the flag, which are kind of the standards. And then we're offering this new mode called Skirmish. But big games, you kind of feel a little bit lost. So we really had to bring that sense of intimacy of a small battle into these 60 player huge battles. So we did that with squads. Five guys, it's a lot easier to get to know them, a lot easier to work together, and then we pit the squads against a rival squad. So we use these smaller squads to coordinate uh, the entire team for larger goals. You just feel like, oh my god, the, the war is happening and I'm in it. All online access is, is free um, for the PlayStation universe. We really wanted to accommodate both new players and old players alike and really have an immediate sense of accessibility the moment somebody jumps into a game. We want people to be able to get in fast, have fun, and not feel intimidated by the game. And we do this by, first of all, having a very streamlined lobby. So when you start playing the game, you want to play competitive, play competitive, find game, and basically, you're in. On the other hand, if you want to experiment with all the options, you know, set up a clan, play with your character a little bit, look at your stats, that's all available to you as well. But you don't have to go digging through 100 different menus to actually get into the game. So the reason community is so important to us at Insomniac is that we really want to develop a relationship with our fans. And similarly, we want our fans to develop relationships with each other. And we just want to create a real community of people who we can trust for feedback that will help us make better games. And that's what the new My Resistance 2.0 is all about. When we began talking about community with Resistance 2, we really did take a hard look at what websites are doing because that's where the future of community is. So with Resistance 2, we wanted to start integrating a lot of those social networking features so that players could find folks who have the same interests that they do, uh, folks who they'd like to play with, versus just being thrown into a game with a bunch of random strangers. We've been thinking about the website since day one, and as a result, there's a lot of crossover, whether it's news, clans, leaderboards, profiles, those things are gonna talk back and forth between uh, My Resistance and the game itself. What's really been eye-opening as, as we grow our community is just 
watching how passionate our fans are and, and we just want to put the platform in place and watch people, you know, just experiment and play with it in their own way. When it comes to community and it comes to the game experience in Resistance 2, we want players to get in, log on, and go blow shit up. That's what's important to us. Go have fun. With Resistance 2, what ended up being the, the ultimate pillar for us for the game is scale. And when I say scale, I'm talking about scale of the environments, the sheer size of the environments. Scale in terms of the numbers of enemies that you'll see attacking you on the screen. And of course, scale of some of the enemies themselves. Bigger characters, bigger levels, more lighting, better lighting, bring those elements to the table. And by just focusing on those and not chasing every other element, I think that that's what really made making Resistance 2 and, and its tech possible. That was only feasible because we had separate teams working on all of these different modes, which of course hooked together. But that created a game of, of, of scale that we had never tried before. Negative, Keystone, pull back. Do you copy? Fighting the Leviathan in Chicago was one of those experiences that when we first got it running, we said, yes, that's, that's what we really were going for. We tried to set it up so the player feels like they're right in the heart of the action and really grappling with this huge conflict all the time. One of the key signatures of an Insomniac game has always been the long view. The ability to see far, and that when you do see far, it still it looks good. That you see lots of elements, that they're active and um, detailed. We try to set things up um, with compositions that the player is forced to look at in game, that really supports that glimpse into deep space. So for a sequence like the the Bay Bridge sequence in, in R2. We started out by blocking out a composition, kind of getting a good idea um, of what the basic pieces would be and how they'd fit together. Then we just add on um, layer upon layer until we get something that's hopefully like really a spectacular moment for the player when they get to experience it for the first time. We've had a couple of years now to optimize a lot of those different technologies that go into drawing a character, whether it's the animation system, which is probably eight times faster than it was in Resistance 1 now. Or the physics system, which um, is maybe three or four times faster than it was in Resistance 1. Our designers can put these shots in where you have 40 guys rushing at you and attacking you. But all those characters are independently doing their AI, and all the effects are running on all of them. And there's no fakery. It was really about finding these new approaches and making them come to life. In terms of the detail that you'll see in the characters, the detail you'll see in the environments, the sheer amount of stuff going on in the game, all that is because we have been able to tweak our engine over the last couple of years. And now uh, Resistance 2 is the pinnacle for us of what we've been able to achieve on PlayStation 3. Our vision of Resistance 2, as big as it was, wasn't as big as what we had when we shipped the game. We really hope that, uh, that, that players kind of just take a minute to take in um, the, the enormity of the scene they're looking at. Capelli! Hopefully it's um, something that will stick with people like after they put the game down even a couple years later.
all of us here at Tonya are really satisfied with what we came out with, and uh, we're really happy to have done it. Resistance 2 is a sequel to Resistance Fall of Man. And our goal with this one was to extend the story significantly so that we answered a lot of questions about who Nathan Hale is, who the Chimera are, why they're here. With Resistance 2, we have three big gameplay modes. We have our single player um, campaign mode, we have our multiplayer competitive mode, and our co-op mode. They all take place in our alternate history, um, America of 1953. Telling stories is tough whether it's games, movies, books, whatever. Let's move. We need to get that bomb within 500 feet of the ship's reactor. It used to be that story was uh, kind of incidental and you, all you had to know was why you were doing what you are doing. But I think these days people want to know that, that there's an emotional attachment between characters in the story, that you're fighting for something. I'm taking our squad to Bryce Canyon to extract Malachi. This isn't a debate, Lieutenant. You're going back to base and that's an order. We really wanted to take the story and make it part of the gameplay. So you're constantly learning about the characters and you're constantly learning about how things work and, and where Nathan Hale comes from. Have you retrieved the viral inhibitors? I'm sorry, sir, there wasn't time. You're learning what's driving you to move to the next chapter and you're finding out what's, what's unfolding around the United States as you're fighting your way through it. Shut it down! It is no longer possible! Which tower activated it? Iceland. It is him, Nathan. It is Daedalus. We want to show the quintessential David versus Goliath story. We want to show uh, a story in which humanity really is clinging on to you know, the last vestiges of its existence. It's really fighting a good fight and losing, but, but it's still not giving up. So, are you going to make your last hours count? Let's go. Convoy waiting to take us into gray territory. When we began talking about locations in the game, we knew that we had the entire United States to choose from. We decided, okay, let's kind of go to the middle of the country and then head south. So we could pick up the swamps in Louisiana and then Chicago in the middle of the country and a farm town in the Midwest. Those were the kind of environments that really struck a chord with us because not only would they stand out in terms of visuals, but they also really reflected America in the 1950s. Concept art for kind of the big moments in the game came together fairly early on. And that really um, sort of influenced and inspired us on the team for everything from the graphic design look of our posters and signs in game to the look of uh, industrial design, like the look of appliances, uh, to the architecture, the look of cars. We took all of that but then juxtaposed it with the, the alien threat. So we have all of that um, kind of happy subject matter played up against uh, you know, skies that are black with the Chimera fleet invading the heartland of America. Viscerality, which was a, a word that we made up, and the idea behind viscerality was to create a more visceral experience, something that uh, made you believe that you were in the game versus just kind of shooting things. And we did that by increasing our gore level. And you'll notice that uh, this time we are what we call chunking enemies. So you can blow enemies into pieces, and we certainly didn't have that with the resistance fall of man. And for us, it's actually very satisfying. It's fun. So where are we headed? Serpa 3. It's a facility near San Francisco. In the game, we talk a lot about how SERPA, the Special Research Projects Administration, repurposes Chimeran technology for human use. We've got a, a crazy arsenal of, of, of weapons. I think the, the programmers and the designers really outdid themselves this time. And one of my favorite weapons in the game is the spider grenade, constructed from the spit 
generated by a marauder. It blows up into this puddle of goo that chases around hybrids and covers them and then bursts into flame. And it's a lot of fun. They are calling to us. Can you hear them? Resistance 2 is our most ambitious project to date. I feel like we were a lot less bound by um, technology limitations this time around. Keep her steady! We, we could really imagine what we wanted to do. We could really kind of um, color script the game, imagine like, like the mood that we wanted to get across. One of our thoughts was, okay, let's make sure that we tell more of the story. Let's give players answers about who Hale is. How are you feeling, Nathan? Mostly human. But I think we didn't realize how much we were adding until we got about halfway through production. We all were looking at each other, and a lot of people were looking at me and going, oh my god, what have you gotten us into? We expect that. How long do I have? That's just part of pushing the envelope when it comes to game development. Three hours, if we are lucky. What we're finding now is, is uh, the term video game almost doesn't apply anymore. We've become interactive entertainment. We're really looked at on par with the movie industry. We've certainly felt the need to bring our cinematics, our, our game experience, our stories to the level of what people expect when they watch a movie. You know, really get immersed in this world. At the same time, they also don't want to be like, oh, I just had a lot of fun shooting stuff. Now I got to put the controller down for 30 seconds and watch a movie. Uh, I think they really kind of want to stay involved, and that's why we really kind of felt like, well, we, I think we can tell the story with some of the, the movies, but also with these little opportunities to get some story across to you, but not make you feel like you need to put the controller down. So we have two forms of cinematics. We have our full rendered movies. We also have our in-game cinematics, the, the Hail Visions, which basically stay in first person to try to keep the, the player immersed in the game. Hail, find that breach! Brace for impact! From an animation standpoint, the big thing that we wanted to focus on with Resistance 2 was bringing the, the movement to a much more realistic experience. Get off me! Easy, Sergeant. <laughs> it's harmless. <laughs> We could use motion capture to get all of our human and realistic soldier animations done, and it really let the animators kind of focus on doing the really keyframe creature animation that we have. Basically, motion capture works. We have a series of cameras. Our stage has about 88 cameras, and those cameras pick up markers that we put all over the body. Those bodies then get translated into the computer and applied to a skeleton, which we later use in the game. Our tendency coming from uh, our cartoonist background was to want to continue to do keyframe animation. And while we managed to do that on the first game, we realized how much work it really was. So the biggest advantage was, was definitely time saving. In animation, there's nothing that I think gets more scrutinized than, than human movement. Motion capture, you know, you got the guys in the suit, they're doing the realistic movement. We're able to bring that data into our scenes and with, with a minimal amount of cleanup on our process, we're getting realistic movement. It really helped us get more story out of our cinematics. You know, sir, you don't have to do this. If we get you to Grand Rapids, they might be able to do something. We found as we were working on Resistance that we needed additional help with the mocap process. Uh, so we gave a call down to the San Diego Visual Arts Group and they offered a lot more than what we were initially looking for. Mike introduced us to the InnerSense camera, which became a huge part of our cinematics. The InnerSense camera is a complement to the motion capture uh, in that we take the motion capture of the characters in the, in, from the stage, put it into a set, and we use this physical camera in a virtual environment to walk around them and then capture the camera motion. Before, you, you would sort of decide, here's where my camera is going to be, and the actors would have to hit their marks. Now the beauty is we're capturing the motion capture off the stage, and now you can just keep playing it over and over again and shoot from any angle, real time, over and over until you get the perfect camera move to match the perfect motion capture performance. 
Intersense is different from standard mocap as far as if you want to do a handheld motion, you want to do a dolly, a pan, a tilt. It's more instantaneous, just like you would on a film set. For Resistance 2, we use the Intersense camera to give a more lifelike film quality to all of the cinematics. Uh, we were using a, a lot of handhelds, which is really hard to do if you're animating a camera. It's a lot of subtlety, and it's something that, in the end, you don't really get what, you, what, what you're 100 percent looking for. I think the Intersense is making developers' lives easier because we can do cameras real time in that environment, whereas an animator it might take them a day or two days to do that same move. Now the camera becomes a part of the story, where before there was a disconnect where the camera really wasn't tied into the dialogue or tied into a reaction shot or tied into the character. Quit yapping and land already! You want to fly this thing? Be my guest! Resistance 2 is the first game to be using this technology. I do think this is going to be a trend that is used in games because I think that the results speak for themselves. I think that the quality of the camera work and the cinematography that is happening in this game will probably set a precedence for all games to come. It's just like, I mean, I was blown away with, with, with uh, what you can do with that camera, and it really got us excited and, and almost starting to think differently about how we wanted to approach our cinematics. You know, Mike's been working with the Intersense camera for years. Sony used it in, in their, their film division, and so he brought it to the games. And I think for us to have the opportunity to really be one of the first titles to, to you know, use this technology in the games is, is a fantastic opportunity. And, and we're really excited about what we can do, you know, not only on Resistance 2, but going forward with it as a, a tool for our cinematics.